The Tale of the Valward Pillows, written by Maita Traba. No one knew Nimia's son shifts until the moment she came forward, climbed the creek in wooden steps with great caution, and once on the platform offered the mayor the Valward Pillow, which lay in her outstretched hands. For a moment, however, she appeared to have changed her mind. She made a half turn, looked at the neighborhood people wearing their Sunday best, crammed together in front of the platform, and she raised the pillow so that all could see. She displayed the pillow as if it were the sacred host, and this action produced in the people, as it did in church, a moment of confusion and silence. Perhaps there was someone incapable of resisting the solemnity of the spectator who went so far as to lower his head and eyes. Then at once the pillow returned to its original position in the two outstretched poles. Nimia Sanchez executed a gracious circus-like movement, made another half turn, and at last handed the gift to its recipient. The neighborhood people were able to admire the center of the black velvet pillow, on which the Colombian coat of arms was meticulously embroidered with crossed flags and gold stars that managed to shine even, the, even when the thick layer of clouds held back the sun. Nimia Sanchez was ageless and nondescript. She possessed the real gift of complete invisibility, while the rest of the neighborhood women were invisible only up to a point, always noticed and greeted by someone. Only a few, like Felisa, for instance, were perceptible at a distance, but in this moment, which corresponded to the bird of the neighborhood, Felisa had barely entered adolescence and had not yet begun to cast her famous electrifying looks, which caused so many disasters. What is certain is that after the inauguration ceremony, the people only remembered Nimia Sanchez in broad pillow. She, the actual author of the marvel, was immediately erased from memory. By the same measure, two days later, no one was able to remember how old Nimia Sanchez was, what she looked like, or how she was dressed, but the prestige of her pillow continued to grow surprisingly. On street corners, women sighed about it, and in these sighs, envy and desire gradually crept in. Soon, one of the greatest aspirations of the neighborhood inhabitants, not only of the women, but also some of the men, was to have in their homes one of the pillows embroidered by Nimia Sanchez. One man who was more daring than the rest was able to find out where she lived and actually went to her house to place an order for a pillow. When he talked about it, it turned out that he was unable to explain anything about Nimia Sanchez or who she lived with. Perhaps she didn't live with anyone because he didn't encounter anyone at all in the dining room or hear sounds emanating from the kitchen or the bathroom or from the floor above. This fact would have caused alarm since the houses of the neighborhood were only allotted to families with children. But as she was the creator of the embroidered pillow, the normal rules did not apply. The person who ventured to order the pillow was not even able to describe anything exceptional with respect to the furniture in Nimia Sanchez's house. It seemed as though she had the same table, chairs and worn out cupboards as everyone else, and that the only exception was a multitude of ragdolls and animals sitting on about the floor, which the man had glimpsed from behind the door that was half opened onto the second room over the bottom floor. After six days, beset by growing anxiety, Mimia Chances presented her client with the new pillow of embroidered black velvet. She invited him to the house, had him pass through the dining room and began to repeat the identical gestures she used on the day of the inauguration. She approached with the plow delicately, lying across her extended palms and raised it by two corners, exhibiting it so that the embroidery could be seen, and then immediately handed it over. She received 
The stipulated payment with disdain and great dignity and promptly shoved her client to the door. Nimiya Sanchez's work enjoyed a sudden increase in popularity when the rest of the neighborhood saw the pillow. The embroidery showed a giraffe in the middle of a jungle full of details right down to the stamps, trunks and leaves. The extraordinary thing was pricelessly the leaves which were embroidered in the most citrident colors without green appearing anywhere between the lilac, blue, yellow, red and orange foliage. The giraffe had chosen to feed on some dark violet leaves which contrasted sharply with the orange. The happy owner of the embroidered pillow was obligated to patiently tolerate the parades of neighbors that wanted to see it, and in three days' time, Nimi Sanchez received more than 14 new orders. The first batch of pillows, which came with a surprising velocity from Nimi Sanchez's house, always pertained to giraffes. In order to not repeat herself, the embroiderer placed the giraffes in the most um, implausible settings. After situating in, it in a jungle, she placed it on plateaus with a large and golden sun, then between multiple suns, later between moons, and once she left, she had quite exhausted the possibilities of the African landscape she placed in the middle of rivers and waterfalls, and finally set it down in her own neighborhood. This last pillow visibly disconcerted its owner and the spectators. The giraffe, always in profile, was imprisoned by superimposed houses, which obviously recalled the outlines of the neighborhood buildings. Nimiya Sanchez put curtains with violet flowers in the windows, the likes of which didn't exist in the area, but she was not able to discuss it completely. The client felt the client felt cheated, since the magic of the pillows consisted in their ability to transport the owner to another reality, to imaginary African landscapes, forests, or plains. With a certain and perhaps some, the client returned the pillow with the giraffe between the houses. The following day, she returned to explain herself to the embroiderer, but the door remains ob obstinately closed although it was clear that Nimiya Sanchez was inside. Neither did she open the door to other clients that insisted on knocking, but greeted them instead with unconscious hostility. During the years that followed, no one heard anything more of Nimiya Sanchez and people forgot about her. The owners of the pillows showed them as if they were precious objects. And they were indeed the only things that saved their owners from the deterioration that implacably consumed the neighborhood. While Chair Lex Brook painted walls filled with stretches and stains and formica tops peeled off the tables, the pillows remained resplendent, the thick gold and silver threads continuing to radiate luminously in the darkness. Meanwhile, Nimiya Sanchez came and went like any other inhabitant of the neighborhood, but thanks to her condition of invisibility, no one recognized her. It was during the time of the child care center scandal and of the dark and equivocal domination of Feliza that her name resounded once again in kitchen gossip. A small boy climbing in the window had entered the daycare center to take a peek since it was that time he was able to explore at his leisure the ex daycare center and current brothel. He went upstairs and downstairs. He traveled bewildered with his mouth open and drooling with a bit through the second floor rooms cramped with coats. And on arriving at this point, he stopped in amazement. The four coats represented a commonplace spectacle for him since in all, the home, all of the homes he knew, the same thing happened, and yet being such a small boy, he was incapable of understanding. The extraordinary thing, however, was that on top of the coats covered with sheets or worn out blankets, piles of profusely embroidered black velvet gloves glowed like something not of this world. At first, in his anxiety, the boy didn't see more than gold and silver outlines and patterns. 
then he approached and recognized figures, the meaning of which escaped him. It attracted his attention that the bodies were nude and that against all logic, they were blue or green. Clumsily and with faltering words, he tried to, later to explain to his mother in the kitchen. He described the perfectly yellow hands holding beautiful them. And here he got confused and was not able to continue on in spite of his mother's pinches. From his confused and gasping story, the neighbors were able to make out that one, given the enormous quantity of pillows Nimia Sanchez had taken up her work again in a feverish manner, and two, that something dark and loathsome now moved through the embroidery. The landscapes no longer dealt with droughts, forests, and rivers, but with something else which they initiated, but were unable to state explicitly. One of the women, more pious than the rest, affirms in a harsh voice that it was necessary to report the situation, and she wanted to see the priest. Once she started to explain the reason for her visit, there was no turning back, the priest, furious and cursing inco incoherently, stalked off towards the sacristy. He must have guessed it, however, because the next day, almost at dawn, the people of that block saw the sacristan, sacristan knocking at Nimia Sanchez's door. He entered and was there for a short while. It was futile to ask him anything afterwards, since he belonged so little to this world. After the end of this incident, the neighbors once again entertained themselves, keeping watch over Nimia Sanchez's house. They noted that for three days, she did not even show her face in the street, and on the fourth, she left carrying, in her unique manner, a large package wrapped in newspaper which, without a dump, contained a pillow. The only surprising and unusual thing was that she carried it wrapped. A neighbor woman who was one of her clients stopped to ask her in a humble voice if she would show the pillow to her, but Nimia Sanchez just glared at her and continued directly to the church. She went in and came out of the dark cave where the priest was located in no more than a matter of minutes. It was Sunday. At the usual hour the people met for mass, the woman, many small children, interspersed among them and a few old people sat near the entrance. A long time passed and the price did not appear. Noon arrived and the woman, a little afraid, looked at each other and shuggled their shoulders. At last, two got up, crossed the black corridor which led to the sacristy and the priest's quarters and knocked. They knocked a long time without answer. Finally, the door opened slightly and the sacristan appeared, wide-eyed and slavering, murmuring incomprehensibly. It wasn't possible to understand him until he shut the door and they heard the lock turn. The people outside withdrew in the midst of frightened comments. Nothing was seen of the price for 15 days. When he climbed up to the pulpit two Sundays later, he looked like he had one foot in the grave. A sudden, the crepitant tooth had overtaken him, dispelling the vainly apocalyptic air which had, led, had held the people in terror of hell. He died shortly thereafter, and although no one understood clearly what has transpired, they all assumed it had to do with Nimia Sanchez's black velvet pillow, which no one ever got to see. That story was translated by Jean Wagon.